Hi everyone, today I'm talking about my top 10 most anticipated games due to be released at Essen 2022. So if you don't know what Essen Spiel is, it's basically a huge convention that happens every year in Germany and where a bunch of new games are released. Now I've used the Board Game Geek preview list about these releases and I do understand that there is some ambiguity and it's not 100% certain that some of these games will be there, but you know, despite that, they are coming out in the near future, so um, I'm sure you'll see these relatively soon. Um, I'm not physically going to Essenspiel, but um, it's nice to know that these games are coming out soon and again, are on the horizon, and you'll probably see them on the channel. Now, I have automatically disregarded the games I've already previewed, or um, pre-ordered, I should say, games such as Autobahn, uh, the new Hannah Makoji, Geisha's Road, and I believe the new Stefan Feld releases such as Hamburg, Amsterdam, and the new Marrakesh um, are coming out with Essen as well. And again, I'm not going to cover these on this list because I've talked about them at nauseum um, through the last couple of years. But before I get started, I want to give a shout out to the show's sponsor, Kienda. .co.uk, who are my go-to online retailer here in the UK. And if you use my link in the show notes or the QR code, then you can get 5% off your first order. But let's get on with the list. At number 10, I have Swindler, which out of all these games is probably the one I'm most intrigued by rather than the most excited by. Um, and a big part of that is because of the designer. So um, this is designed by Matthias Kramer, who I think is an outstanding um, games developer. He's brilliant at what he does and everything he's done has been to a certain you know, degree of quality. But this is being advertised as a push your luck and take that game. So I love push your luck games, but I'm not often so keen on take that. But considering who the designer is here, I'm pretty confident that the take that isn't going to be as abrupt or you know silly as you'd expect with a lot of games. There's going to be something clever here about how that take that is used. But from my understanding and just from my general vibe from looking at the um, the game, it seems like this could be his twist on something like the Quacks of Quedlinburg. So I'm interested to see a designer like, you know, like Matthias Kramer's take on a game like that. Now you're talking at a game that's less than an hour on the lighter end of the spectrum, which is normally not his forte. So for all those reasons, I'm definitely I'm going to give this game a look and hopefully it's going to be something special. So that is Swindler at number 10. At number nine, I have Rise. So I don't know a tremendous amount about this game, but um, one of the things that's being touted about this game is that there's going to be 10 different tracks that you can climb up. Now, I love tracks in board games. It's one of my favorite elements. You know, I love just seeing how far I can progress about what all they can do. And I'm, ass I'm assuming that these different tracks are going to interact with each other as you go, unlock you benefits, unlock you points, all that kind of stuff, which I love. Um, this has the industrial vibe to it, which is a setting I tend to enjoy in general. And another game that is being advertised as taking less than an hour to play. So hopefully there's some bite here, hopefully there's some meaningful decisions, and that track climbing is satisfying, variable, and um, lots to explore each time you play. So um, yeah, the look of the game looks, you know, it looks great, um, and hopefully the gameplay is going to match that. So that is Rise at number nine. At number eight, I have Applejack, which is an Uwe Rosenberg design. So if you watch my content regularly, you might know that Rosenberg is a designer that I'm kind of hit or miss with, and the games I tend to like of his are the lighter ones. And I believe Applejack is gonna fall into that category. It looks like it has some puzzly element to it, a bit of you know a spatial puzzle, I think there's some tile placement as well. So um, hopefully this is gonna be up there with his you know great tile placement games such as Nova Luna or Patchwork, um, but a different take on it, and a new, you know, a new take on the whole genre of um, yeah, puzzly tile placement games. Um, it looks cool, I love the name of it. Um, another game that's gonna be relatively quick to play, so games like this tend to hit my table quite often. Um, so yeah, who knows? Knows, this one could be something special. So that is Applejack at number eight. At number seven, I have Galanus. So Galanus is a game I've actually had my eye on for many years. Um, I think it's just about to come out. I think this is one that's a bit touch or go um, on whether it's going to be there at Essen or not. But this is a medically themed game as I believe you're trying to you know, conjure these potions, you're trying to publish theories. Um, I love that kind of you know, thematic setting. Um, but the thing that really intrigued me about this game was the fact that it, you know, it is a worker placement game, but I believe in this one you can not only place your workers, but you can also remove them from the board when you want, so that you can kind of camp on spots if you think somebody's going to sneak in there. 
and you know triggering the um, to resolve the actions is, is, is as important as taking the action in the first place and you can decide which order and how to prioritize those different things so I think that's going to unravel some strategy there and um, you know prioritizing actions and triggering things in the right order could be a big part of the game which I tend to enjoy now I could be misinterpreting you know misinterpreting how this game is going to work but I know some of the people who've um, you know, tried it and play tested it have very good things to say. And um, yeah, my, um, you know, my optimism is high with this one. So that is going to be Galanus at number seven. At number six, I have Ready, Set, Bet. So this game is a real-time racing and betting game. So basically one person is going to be constantly rolling dice, or I believe there's going to be a, a companion app as well. Um, and that is going to determine how far these horses move. Or I believe if you roll uh, like a two, the two horses are going to move. If you roll it twice in a row, it gets like another boost and things like that. Now, obviously that's going to mean that the horses in the middle, like the sevens, sixes and eights, are going to be a lot faster because those numbers are going to get rolled more often. But when you roll the higher numbers, I believe they move further. So it is kind of balanced that way. And I love this idea of the real time thing of you know, the seven might be really running, running away with that. People are chucking their um, you know, betting chips down on this big kind of betting mat, getting the best odds. Um, and I believe there's like variable different um, bets you could put on as well for lots of you know, variability. So it sounds really interesting that way. Now, I am a little bit apprehensive about the real time thing because generally... I tend to like real-time games for the first few plays, and then I quickly tire of them. Um, but the idea of this one seems relatively simple. I tend to like betting games and you know wagering. Um, so who knows, this one could be good. Um, maybe gonna be a little bit chaotic, but I suppose only time will tell. But again, I like racing games, I like betting games. This one sounds simple, but fun. And um, yeah, I get high expectations for Ready, Set, Bet. At number five, I have Deal With The Devil. So this game is either going to be absolutely amazing or it's not gonna be right for me. I think it's gonna be you know, one of those polar opposites. Um, so this is a game that requires exactly four players to play. And it's a, you know, a resource management Euro game, but with hidden roles. So I believe one person's gonna be the devil, one's like a cultist, I, I believe one's like a, an innocent bystander and so on. And you are just trying to do you know standard resource management, all that kind of stuff. But there is a blind trading phase that uses an app to facilitate you know, trading between the players. But because nobody knows who each other are, you're gonna be doing these things on this app so you're not, you don't quite know who you're trading with. And um, I believe that everybody has different incentives. So like the devil, um, I believe they can give away resources quite, you know, quite frugally, or quite frivolously, I should say. But in exchange for those resources, they can acquire people's bits of soul and um, you know, strike up these deals that are going to be tempting for the other players. So thematically, this game sounds pretty amazing. Can it be pulled off to a high standard? I I'm pretty sure it will do because this is designed by Matus um, Kotri, who is the designer for Alchemist, which was one of the pioneering games when it came to app integration into board games. And it was pulled off to an exceptionally high standard and that game still holds up pretty well now. So um, I know this game has been in development for many years. So I'm pretty confident it's gonna be fine tuned, well developed and do what it's supposed to do. So the app integration, the four player strict play account and the idea that this is gonna take probably at least two hours to play could be obstacles to make this one perfect for me, but if the gameplay is strong enough, this could be a home run. So that is Deal With The Devil at number five. At number four, I have Findorf by Friedemann Fries. So Fries is a designer who really intrigues me. You know, everything he puts out, I'll cast my eye upon. His games normally work for me. I do tend to like his designs, especially when they are a bit bigger and a bit more grandiose. So Findorf is being described as a economic uh, engine builder, I believe. And I believe you are building these buildings and these buildings are gonna dictate a ton of different strategies you can go down. So I think every approach you take the game, you can do, you know, go a different path. I believe the resource market in the game is similar to something like Power Grid with the sp supply and demand of you know, particular resource types, which again is a mechanism I love in board games, supply and demand in general. So, I'm, again, another game I'm optimistic about. This could be up there with his greats. Who knows? Um, but um, yeah, at the moment, just looking from the outside in, it looks like it's ticking a lot of boxes for me. So definitely intrigued, intrigued by Findorf by Friedemann Fries. 
At number three, I have Lacrimosa. So most of my excitement about this game is based on the setting and theme of the game because this is all about finishing Mozart's Requiem. Now, I'm a huge classical music fan. I'm a big fan of Mozart. Um, and I'm surprised that this theme has not been used more often because music is such a, a, it's a, it's a genre that, or a setting that lends itself to board gaming so well because it is, you know, patterns, it's formulaic, and a lot of those things suit board games. But in this game, I believe you are commissioning different composers to finish his work. Um, and it's all done through a card driven system where you can use these cards in two ways. Um, I'm not quite sure how that works, but deck building is something that um, yeah, doesn't excite me terribly. But if it's kind of contained and pretty tight in the way it works and doesn't constantly need new material to keep it interesting, then this could be the deck builder for me, considering the setting and theme and the idea of it. So yeah, very excited about how this is gonna get pulled off. And again, another game where the intrigue factor is high. So that is Lacrimosa at number three. At number two, I have Woodcraft, which is the latest co-design by Vladimir Suki. So Suki games over the last few years have been absolute colossal hits for me. So whenever he releases a game now, I'm pretty much sure that I'm going to like it and I have confidence in his design pedigree. So this one, it has all the hallmarks of a Suki game that you'd like, you know, the combo and actions together, that domino effect to get big, satisfying turns. And the fact that this is a dice game just ups the ante even more for me. So. I believe one of the key concepts of this game is that when you acquire dice and use them, you can actually carve them up to what you need. So for example, if you have a, a dice with six pips on it, you can carve that up into say two threes or you know, a three, a two and a one, that kind of thing. So I'm interested to see how that works in practice. Um, but out of all of these, these are probably, well, this is probably the game I'm most confident that I'll like, and it's gonna be yeah, uh, just, just gonna, fit into my collection well, just has its place reserved, I suppose. So that is Woodcraft at number two. And finally, at number one, I have Teletum, which is the latest design by Daniele Cuscini and Simone Luciani. So this is part of the T-series of games. And I must say over the last couple of years, the T-series hasn't been as strong as it initially was because I thought that they started to lean a bit far to, um, to try and be different and try to be innovative. And they lost a lot of the, you know, the, the clean rules. They lost a lot of the sophistication of the earlier games because it became, again, a bit too clunky, a bit too complex for the sake of it. Now, from my initial impressions of Teletum, it seems like they're going back to basics and using dice in a simple but interesting way. So in this one, I believe the dice only has two meanings. So if you're drafting, say, a, a dice with a value five on it, the five is going to represent the, uh, the number of resources you'll take of that type. But the higher the number of resources you take, it means the weaker action you'll have in association to that. So in comparison, if you take a, a dice with only, say, one resource on it, then you'll get a stronger action. And I'm quite interested to see how that works. Again, not convoluted, straightforward, but compelling decisions. And um, this is also stepping away from that South American ancient theme and going into the more traditional Euro, uh, you know, European um, Renaissance theme, which is one of my favorite settings. So hopefully this is gonna be a, you know, a revamp of the genre and put things back on track after it's been a little bit misguided over the last couple of years. But I'm surprised this did come out at number one because of, again, the, the way that the last couple of games didn't quite resonate with me, but um, they managed to drag me back in with this one. So hopefully they don't let me down again. So that is Teletum at number one. So there we have it. Those are the 10 most anticipated board games that I'm looking forward to coming out at Essen this year. Please do let me know what games you're anticipating because no doubt I've missed a few here. There's a ton of games coming out as there is every year and I just cannot cast my eye over them all. And of course, it's going to be some games that have flown under the radar that are going to be hits that nobody knows about for a long time. But if you have enjoyed the video, please be sure to hit like and subscribe to my channel. But for everybody else, I'll see you next time on Chairman of the Board. Bye-bye.